And our first segment will be Concealed Carry Framing the Issue. Parental Advisory. Why are we here today? Well, this presentation is designed to help people frame the issues around concealed carry beyond just acquiring a pistol and a simple four-hour class. Right now, today, as we speak, there are 17.5 million Americans that have sought license from their government to carry a concealed pistol. That does not include citizens in states with constitutional carry that can just carry as, as a course of their daily lives. On any given day, the best numbers I've seen, about 3 million Americans are armed about their, their daily lives. Most permit holders will get minimal training. They will take a four or eight hour class. Here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, you can go online and click your way through a course, get a certificate, and that's good enough. Other people, you can take a DD Form 214 from when you were discharged in the military during the Vietnam era, and that is proof of training. I submit that, well, we might want to look deeper than that. They rarely practice. I have read from the National Shooting Sports Foundation for the average shooter, gun owner, 300 rounds a year is about all they manage. And I, I, I shudder to think of how most of those rounds are expended. They lack soft skills and a contextual grounding of going about their daily lives while armed. Consequently, they, 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 people tend to think, well, I'm, I'm carrying a hammer, and every problem becomes a nail. And we don't have to look very far in, in the media to find examples of significant errors of judgment and highly consequential actions as a result. And here, this captures it, I have a gun. Well, what, what you actually have is a holster full of consequences, dire consequences. And that needs to be part of our thought process. Carrying changes everything, every interaction we have. Though it's just part, we, we forget we have this thing in our body, but we are retaining that capacity at a moment's notice. to end a life and change yours forever. And it must be worth it. Let's define that right now. Worth it preserves your life or prevents serious bodily injury. No other justification. Now you notice that I have an asterisk up there, and that is if we choose to intervene on behalf of a third party. And I have a presentation on that at the end, uh, at the end of this course. So the purpose today is to better inform your decisions, focus your preparation, expand your options for before incidents, during and after a confrontation or assault. Let's analyze our mission. I, I, I have to default back to that, that military thing sometimes, and it can be beneficial. We carry to maintain our health so that we, we will not suffer from violent crime and uh, be wounded or victimized in that regard. We want to maintain our freedom to move about the country. And we have to think about that from a couple perspectives. First, from a criminal assault paradigm element, and finally, from being uh, subjected to the legal system. And finally, I, I wish to maintain what little wealth I've accrued during my time on the planet. That is why, why we carry, and by that, I mean, from the wealth perspective, there was a case in Washington State about three years ago. It was a self-defense case that was tried. Uh, it cost $640,000 for that not guilty verdict. The bottom line, I wish to live a fulfilling, productive life with minimal drama. Now, our mission drives everything. It drives our mindset. It drives the skills we acquire and the equipment we purchase and train with. If we look at our mission. Now, this guy's mission as a Marine infantry man is to locate, close with, and destroy. That's, that's not in our wheelhouse. Law enforcement officers enforce the law, capture criminals. He is a training equipped for that. He has his radio, his pepper spray, his baton, whatnot. The infantry guy has his uh, grenade launcher and his optics and whatnot. 
Now, this lady, her mission is to thrive as a law-abiding citizen. Uh, perhaps a Smith & Wesson shield or other single-stack pistol, uh, pepper spray, and a cell phone. An effectively armed citizen knows themselves and is appropriately trained and equipped for that mission statement we discussed just to go home with that mindset, have acquired the skill and capacity to achieve that mission, period. So here's an example of what right can look like. The beer guy is walking out of the drive through, but as soon as he did, out of the drive through, but as soon as he did, I saw the guy coming with the gun. The owner of a carryout in Illyria faces a struggle of life and death when a would-be robber tries to force his way through a door to the cash register of the store. The man eventually succeeds in getting through the door, but the owner has a surprise she carries in her hip pocket. I reacted as fast as I could to shut the door to get a barrier between him and I, and he starts busting through the door. He makes it through, and as soon as I see him, so who here thinks that she rehearsed slamming that door shut, using her body as a wedge, reaching into her pocket, shooting across, coming across her body? Was that the weaver or isosceles position that she used? <laughs> she improvised on the fly. What was her first clue that she had a problem? Someone advancing toward her deliberately with a pistol in his hand. You notice the delivery guy, was, he was completely out of sorts. His shock threshold had been busted. He was outside of his realm of experience or had anything he ever thought he would see. And as a result, he was momentarily paralyzed in a very perilous situation. Uh, when she bought that pistol, she probably went to the gun store. Yeah, I can do that. She never envisioned the requirement of having to access that pistol while on her butt with her legs bent, making it very hard to access that pocket. That was a magnificent piece of work that she performed, improvised on the fly. Now here's an example of what wrong looks like. This or is a skate gun. park in America's heartland, and there's two girls having a girl fight. And this guy decides to intercede with a pistol in his hand. That is what wrong looks like. That is someone deciding to be Dudley Do-Right or Deputy Dog and intervening with lethal force in a third party affair that was essentially a slap fight. That is not our mission statement. We are not law enforcement. We are not there to preserve the peace and restore order. An executive summary from my friend Lynn Gibbons. I do not carry a pistol so I can impose my will on others. I carry a pistol so others cannot impose their will upon me. Threat analysis. Uh, as an intelligence background kind of guy, I give people warning about the threat, what they could potentially face. In this case, it's a whole spectrum. Here's an example of just a, a road rage incident. Let's go! Come on! Get the fuck out! Get the fuck out! Let's go! Get the fuck 
Now, in just a moment, he acquires an audience. And his display ramps up even further. Was that man anywhere near his rational mind? No, he wasn't. Was that a shooting problem? Not at that point, it wasn't. Could it have potentially become one? Yes. Had he come, come, and made his way through that glass. Uh, you'll notice he did a lot of this. Arms go up. That does a couple of things. Uh, first off, it's like a cat puffing up its fur. It looks bigger. And secondly, it gets major muscle groups moving, which releases testosterone, vitamin T. Uh, there was actually a study done in England. They took a group of people, ran them off the street, into an indoor pool, the kind with the, like the big the diving boards, like the 5,000 meter boards kind of thing. And they, had, they offered people a lot of money to jump into the water. Perfectly safe. But it, they had two control, control groups. One, uh, they just put a clock on them and like, OK, go ahead. You can do it. You can do it. And it was like two minutes to get them to jump. Control group two would do a deep knee squat. Ah! Ah! Walk, walk up and jump into the water just that quick. Pay me. That is one end of the encounter spectrum we can expect to find uh, just friction. Harsh words, loud noises. Here's the other end. The reason I killed him was because he was a child molester. But you did in fact kill him. Oh, sure. And you intended to kill him. Oh, sure. Yes. What you have here is a gentleman. Well, let's give you the full rundown on him. He uh, was a lifelong prisoner in the Michigan State Penitentiary. His first offense, 81, he's about my age, actually. We're kind of like a peer group in that regard. He stole a car, and he caught two and a half years for that. He went in, finished, essentially finished his high school education in prison. Second offense, breaking and entering, burglary. He caught a five-year stretch for that. He wasn't out very long, was he? So he gets out in five years, 89, he's out, and he gets larceny, and he catches a three year, half year, or three, three years and two months for that. Now, now he's done his bachelor's, he's working on his master's degree, equivalent. And then he graduates to the big time, murder in the first degree, life sentence. So let's look at this from his perspective. He's in jail, he's never gonna breathe free air again. And then one day, Fate gives him a great gift. A cellmate convicted of child molestation. And not just a child molester, but a child molester from the law enforcement community. So from his perspective, as he contemplates getting old and weak in prison, he has a chance to establish the most awesome prison cred imaginable, killing a cop child molester. So he beat this guy unconscious, took one of his shoelaces, used it as a ligature, and strangled him. And then, and I don't know what he was thinking in order to like, uh, dispose of the evidence of the crime, flushed the shoelace down the toilet. Like it would take Sherlock Holmes to figure out exa exactly what. The game is afoot, Watson. What could possibly have happened here? And uh, as you saw, he owned it. Yes, yes, I did do that. That is an apex predator. If we encounter one of them, who do you think has the advantage? For mo for, oh, absolutely. For most of us, uh, we go through our lives, a little friction, a few bumps along the way. It takes a while to provoke us to violence. That's his default position. So let's talk about a spectrum of encounters we can, we can have. This is not to scale, if it were, that this bit would be all the way over to the right. First off, we have amiable social exchange. And I had many today in the lobby of this hotel. How are you, sir? I'm fine, thanks. 
Thank you very much. Have a pleasant day. Some years ago, I met a guy that was, he had had a hard life. And he was wearing a leg cast, and he looked at me, and he said, you be, you, you be careful today. And I'm like, God bless you, sir. Thank you for that. For that. America, right? America, doing just America things. The eternal pursuit where, you know, boy chases girl, girl chases boy, and then the rest, I just can't keep up with it. I'm, I'm behind the curve. The polite society. We move down a bit. We have uh, nuisance and friction, street beggars, arrogant people, inconsiderate people, chemically altered people. And how many kinds of chemically altered people are there? There's two kinds anymore. There's illegally chemically altered and legally chemically altered. Emotionally disturbed, just, well, I'm going to use the term assholes in general are out there. They can, uh, they can engage in all kinds of uh, events or a friction, you know, yelling, cutting people off, what have you. We move down a bit. Now we move into the realm of violence. Aggressive panhandlers, stopping your freedom of movement. Angry people, people who are seeking status for their group. Uh, people will do amazing things for that, uh, to include fights. Uh, alcohol, significant others, insults, egos, those are all kinds of things that layer on top of that to amplify that, that uh, potential outcome. Move down, we have the lethal threshold. And you'll notice I have it just off to the left because it slides a bit. There's an issue I will raise right now. I'm not going to go too far into the law, but there's disparity of force issues. Uh, people who are less able to fight, less able to take care of themselves, smaller, diminutive, otherwise compromised, their, their justification to use lethal force is a bit less stringent than somebody else might be. But that's a whole uh, other ball of uh, wax. I'll leave that to the, to the lawyers types. We cross that line, though, in the strong arm robbery or assault and rape, armed robbery, takeover robberies and home invasions, mass violence incidents, dedicated killers, like we saw in Charleston, Chattanooga, Aurora, San Bernardino. It uh, just seems to become more and more of a trend. Once we've established our potential spectrum of encounters, we need to map our skills to that, those requirements. At the end, we have keep your ego in check. Be self-aware of what you're projecting. Engage in good communication. Uh, across the line, at the bottom there, you'll see know the law of carry self-defense as it applies, and then stop bleeding through the whole spectrum. Now, keeping ego in check as well, the big thing is just don't, don't be an asshole. And how can you spot one? <laughs> Rut row, Raggy. Looks like we found one. Moving on down, for nuisance and friction, we have to recognize these impending signs of a problem. That gives us options. Number one, of course, is leaving. Managing conflict. Understanding the human reactions of fight, flight, freeze, posture. For violence at this end of the spectrum, which is less lethal. I mean, there are types of violence. There's social violence, asocial violence, pro-social violence, either one of which can get you killed. But there's obviously a spectrum across there. We need to have a, a degrees of capacity across that spectrum. Some empty hand skills. Pepper spray or improvised weapons. Then we cross that line. Now, down here we have much, much more likely, much more useful skills but less likely for people to acquire them because, well, I have a gun. Why can I possibly need to talk to somebody? We cross that line. Now we have the application of hard skills. Less likely, but of ultimate consequence. Now, Tom Gavin gave me the four R's. I've added one. Robbery, rape, Road rage, respect, and I added rampage to it. These are pretty much the things that would, would put us in a position of being justified in using lethal force. Strategy and tactics. We have, we have to have some strategic principles. And I have ADIF for awareness, avoidance, deselection, de-escalation, evasion, and appropriate use of force. 
Uh, unpacking that a bit, is, oh, and I have a whole presentation on awareness. Uh, it's much more than just situational. But awareness without action is useless. And we'll be unpacking that in a subsequent presentation. Avoidance. I will default to uh, Master John Farnham's statement on this, is don't go to stupid places with stupid people at stupid times and do stupid things. Avoid the stupid. It's amazing how calm and sedate your life can be. Deselection. If we carry ourselves appropriately, we can be deselected from criminal violence because we'll just, well, we'll look like work. De-escalation de of an of a escalating situation, usually a conflict, it's amazing what people will do over a parking spot. And I'll be discussing that during my managing conflict while armed segment. Evasion. Uh, an example I will use for that is about two years ago in Kansas, in a restaurant establishment, uh, two gentlemen of Indian extraction uh, uh, from India, India, garment employees, were beset upon by a, just a piece of human debris. Uh, he thought that they were around him, and he was haranguing them. He was escorted from the, from the restaurant. He subsequently went out to his car, armed himself, and came back in and killed these two people. So the takeaway from there is if you find yourself in that situation where you have that kind of interaction with someone and they leave, you should too. Maybe out the back door, maybe with escort. Because, well, you just don't know. And then finally, appropriate and justified use of force. So we will acquire tactics and skills to support that strategy. And these tactics can be managing unknown contact. Muck, from courtesy Craig Douglas, that's his term, and he is the muck master. Moving and shooting, shooting and moving. Employing obstacles to give us space for options. Finally, the hard skill, concealing, drawing a pistol. Employing pepper spray. Performing the uh, Todd Green fast fundamentals accuracy skill test in seven seconds or so, which would indicate a very high level of learning and capacity with your pistol. And then for the ground fighting part, refuse the mount, stuff like that. But skills are kind of like ice cream. Everybody has their favorites. It comes in many flavors. And there's hard skills and soft skills, like hard ice cream and soft ice cream. And they will all melt over time. Hard skills, and we love these because we can quantify them, we can blow holes in paper and say, yes, I did that. Load, unload, reload, perform a draw stroke, clear a malfunction, a precision shooting drill, speed drills, and then going hands-on in the mat room. We love that sort of stuff. Soft skills, well, here's where most people fall down. Recognizing pre-incident indicators. I have an upcoming segment on exactly that topic. Street communications, appropriate language, tone, and volume. Reading a room or a crowd. Understanding basic human psychology and body language. And skills are like ice cream. I want you to think Neapolitan. Uh, in my classes, I give people a scoop of chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry as much as I can. Other courses, and I recommend them to isolate those skills, well, shooting would be all chocolate. Hand-to-hand uh, -hand work might be the vanilla. And then the, the soft skill stuff, like William, where Dr. William April excels, would be the strawberry. But you need scoops. To build these skills the right way, is first, we have to figure out what we need to know. And there's a lot more to it than maybe just taking a quick quickie course and clicking your way through a few uh, internet online classes. So if we look at this from a perspective of what we need to know, this is our threat environment violence against us. Everything we need to know that will come at a cost. Time, money, energy, effort. So we have to apportion this across competing priorities of our job, our family, etc. And we all face the tyranny of time. Only so many hours in a day. Once we've identified these skills though, based upon our lifestyle assessment, we acquire them after due diligent research because I mentioned earlier that this is one of the greatest times for instruction in, in the self-industry. 
But to quote a little Jenkins, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. I just uh, would say caveat emptor, buyer beware. Validate these skills in class and in force on force training and then maintain them. And we continue that cycle. Now that might mean that somewhere along the line we find a better way to do things. So we acquire that skill and we work out with the old and with the new. It's a constant cycle. So this Venn diagram illustrates the stuff you know in the green overlap with the stuff you don't know, but you need to know. There's the overlap. Then we got there's the stuff you realize you don't know, and there's stuff you know that's wrong. And for the longest time, I just was wrong on some topics. And I've since been educated. You just cannot, this is such a grave matter. You cannot hold on to anything as a sacred cow. Some truths might be fundamental and elemental, but others, particularly revolving equipment and technique, evolve. Guns and gear, eh. So from at the end of our training cycle, we want to have acquired this end state where we will have established boundaries and made pre-decisions on what we will do when we identify a circumstance. We will have mental maps of these scenarios. We will then acquire and maintain and train with the appropriate equipment. I, I, have, uh, I do 25, 30 classes a year and inevitably I'll have someone show up to a class, take their carry pistol off and put on their entirely different model training pistol. And I don't understand it. I do understand having two of the exact same model. I don't understand uh, carrying a, a plastic pistol and then training with a 1911, for instance. You're missing a great opportunity. We acquire these skills and training in context. And then we go about our real mission, which to live our lives unbounded. That concludes this portion. I'm looking forward to your questions and comments on the YouTubes. Thank you.